Pleased to introduce uh, attorney Brenna Galvin from Mazur Amundsen, Boggio and Hendricks. She will be presenting on important documents and decisions to think about for where you are today with your loved one's journey with Parkinson's and into the future. So I will hand off the clicker that I don't know how to use to <laughs> Brenna. I believe it's on. Okay, great. <laughs> and thanks. then you can have this now. Thank wow, you. Wow, <laughs> thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for staying around. Um, Today, I really want to spend some time going over with you, if I can make this work. I want you to be able to leave today receiving really practical advice about what legal or medical decisions you guys should be thinking about um, for your care receivers or yourselves. And I want you to have strategies for planning for long-term care, be that um, relief for you at home um, or more advanced care practices like bringing in outside caregivers or potentially looking at care facilities. How do you evaluate those different care options and really navigate the senior housing landscape? Um, and then finally, I just want to give you more resources. I know that's kind of the, the motto of the day is, Really make sure that all of you have re the resources you need to be an effective caregiver and make sure that your care receivers have um, kind of everything in their toolbox to have the best quality of life and health outcomes. So I think that one thing I tell to everyone, any chance I can get, when you're planning, your priority should be make decisions early, right? Let's not wait until a crisis because at that time it's often too late to have a full set of planning strategies available. And when you're in crisis, right, our brains can only deal with so much at once. We're worried about our loved ones. We're worried about their health. We're worried about that one crisis, we can't think thoroughly about all the legal and practical decisions that have to be made at that time. I want you to plan early so you can um, plan for the worst and live your best. That's kind of my motto. So um, as part of this, I really want each of you to have an identified team. It's easy for us to say, and I think that everyone here today is telling you, make sure you have a coalition around you, right? I want you to start identifying those roles. And I'll give you kind of who all needs to be part of that trusted circle so you know how to start building that team and how to utilize them best, okay? So... You know, on your tables, you have the caring and coping books from the Parkinson's Foundation. And we know that the incidence and severity of Parkinson's disease varies greatly from day to day and from person to person. But being organized and planning in advance really allows for the best health outcomes. And so I, it can also provide you a lot of relief and take away from other potential stressful situations. So with that kind of frame of reference, I want to go into a little bit more about um, how to get organized. Where should you begin? Because some of this is not, um, you know, I'm an elder law attorney, which means that I work with people who often need planning, but they also need how do we plan for long-term care? How do we navigate chronic care needs? So much of what I do, though, is also coaching people on how do you begin? Where do you start? Because some of that you don't need a lawyer for. You just need to know the right information, okay? So some of the first things you can do is really create a one-stop shop, okay? I want you all to have kind of a place, a file, a binder, a folder in your computer, whatever media is easiest for you that contains really your important documentation and notes, okay? This is important for you as caregivers, and it's also important for other people on your team, other family members or loved ones who might have to step in 
if you need respite or if you're otherwise not available, okay? So in your one-stop shop, you should have a healthcare directive, and we'll go into that more in a little bit. You're, you should also have a HIPAA release. So every time somebody goes to the doctor now, the doctor wants something signed off about who they can disclose medical information to. Your care receiver needs to sign a HIPAA release, a general release form, to the people that are on his team, either you, his or her team. So the caregiver or loved ones who are in the trusted circle who needs to be able to access all medical information. You should also have all the doctor's contact information. And I say all the doctors, right? The neurologist, the internist, the primary care physician, um, the psychiatrist, all of these people who might be working together, we need all of their contact information, right? What, um, is it all within one medical clinic or do you have multiple that you go to? That should all be located and itemized in one place. And some of you might say, yes, I know this off the top of my head, Bretta. I have their numbers on speed dial. But does everyone who might need to access that information know where they can get it, okay? We also need to have a current medication list. Now, with PD, we know that the medication management and schedules are so very important to overall health and well-being. So current medication lists and schedules and having that, I know it changes sometimes and that can be hard to keep up to date, but try and have a form that's there and readily available. You should also keep clinic notes in one place, right? I think that this is the hardest thing, keeping paperwork organized when you're caregiving Seems like a never-ending task, right? The mail comes in and you're like, I have lots of things to deal with and this often drops to the bottom of your to-dos. But once you spend a little time setting up this one-stop shop or this file, um, keep your clinic notes available to you that you can look back as a resource. So if you forget, because you've got a lot on your plate, you can return to them at a later date. And then your appointment schedules. I heard um, one woman share her story of frustration that, you know, it's sometimes hard when you're like, why can't you remember? We just went through the daily schedule. If you have an appointment schedule laid out that's easily ac accessible to you and your care receiver, this can be a, an ease of a burden. You can have everyone know where that one-stop shop is, where you can go to and see that information regularly. So... As you notice, besides the healthcare directive, most of those things are not legal documents, but they are important, okay? I want you to get in the mindset today of thinking about um, getting organized and getting the education you need to get this together, and so much of that is beyond just your powers of attorney, your wills, your trusts, or whatever legal estate planning mechanisms that you need, okay? So I spoke a little bit about in that one-stop shop, you need a healthcare directive. A healthcare directive has been called many things over the years, so I put some of them in your material. So before they were called living wills and durable powers of attorney for healthcare, since 2008, the state of Minnesota now calls those health care directives. It's all kind of in, embodied in one document. The most important thing that can be done in a health care directive is the designation of a legal agent. Who is going to be the legal um, medical decision maker if your loved one can't speak for themselves? Okay? So... Some people look at me and they say, yeah, we're married though. The doctors are going to let me make the decision because we're married. Um, I wouldn't count on that in the medical profession, right? So uh, lawfully, the legal agent has the authority to make um, medical decisions on behalf of the principal, the person who signs the form, but a spouse doesn't necessarily have the ability to make all medical decisions for their spouse, 
okay? So marriage alone or a marriage certificate is not enough. You need a health care directive in place. So the nomination of the agent is the most important part, making sure it's clear who is the go-to, who is the decision maker. In a health crisis or when you're managing chronic care, we want it to be very clearly identified who's the go-to for those decisions. Now, this becomes especially important if there are family members with lots of different perspectives about what should be done. And even if you, your family sounds just like what Garrison Keillor always talked about, the perfect kind of Minnesotan family, right? You know, I've not met one yet. I've been doing this for um, six years now. I've not met the perfect Minnesotan family. We all come to crises with a different perspective, and our relationships with individuals are all different, okay? So it really helps to have clearly delineated um, decision makers and identification of the wishes. So the contents of a healthcare directive can also include things like care preferences, all right? Do not resuscitate, do not intubate orders can be present in a healthcare directive. End of life decisions, a lot of people say to me, you know, I don't want heroic measures, all right? I hear that almost daily, but what heroic measures may be may look different to each and every one of you. Now, what's hard about this kind of the expansion beyond the designation of an agent, these care preferences, many of us are not medical professionals, right? We don't really know, well, maybe this treatment would work well. It might be invasive, but it might have a great um, ability to bring my loved one back to health or back to kind of status quo, and so sometimes people have a really hard time when we get into the wishes, delineating what they really want. So there are tools that can help you start thinking about that and framing your, your wishes and what you'd want. One of those tools you can get online, okay, it's called Go Wish. Have you played Go Fish? Not in the last maybe 30 years for me, but um, this, it's a card game that you can sit down with your loved one. It's just a, it's a mechanism for you to start broaching these topics, but each card has a different um, care decision or value on it, and you prioritize these cards. You sit down on the table and you physically move them around to say, oh, this matters a lot to me. This is one of my values. So some of my clients say, if my cost of care is so burdensome that it's going to eat my life savings, I don't want to keep living. Some of that is a financial value, right? That's not really a care value. That was a financial value. Others tell me, if I can enjoy a scoop of ice cream every day, keep me going, all right? Um, And so that's more of a, Um, what's enjoyment to them, right? That matters to them more than how much it costs to serve them that scoop of ice cream on a daily basis, right? So it's going to look different for all of you, and it might look different between you as the caregiver and your care receiver. But it's a great way for you to sit down and start kind of looking at these options. Now, if you are on Medicare, okay? Medicare also pays for you to have um, a doctor's appointment that's specifically related to end-of-life planning, okay? That, the purpose of that um, appointment would be to talk through some of these um, and questions about um, end-of-life care and health care decisions, things like, when would you want maybe palliative or hospice care versus other rehabilitative measures, okay? 
So that's another great resource that if you have questions that are more medical in nature, you can go to your healthcare provider for and it can be covered if, you're, if you are a Medicare recipient, okay? So the other thing that a healthcare directive can do is also talk about what happens with your body after you die. Um, this is less about how you want to live and now what, what happens with your, your physical body after you pass. Do you have preferences about a funeral or a burial or a memorial service, cremation, um, or body donation? Okay, so some of my clients have a request that they want to be sure that their bodies can go to science and be, help maybe with research and, and planning for others with PD. Maybe it could be a benefit to them down the road. So you can indicate some of those preferences in a healthcare directive as well. Now, the great thing about a healthcare directive is even though it's a legal document, you don't need a lawyer to do it. Okay, so you can do this really on your own. There are some legal components that you need to make sure are satisfied. It's either got to be notarized or it needs to be witnessed by two people unrelated to you that are over age 18. But you can do this and begin working on it. A lot of my clients come in and they say, oh, that healthcare directive. Yeah, we're working on it. You know, they've been working on it for five years, right? It's sitting in the same spot on, the, on their desk, and they're, it's not a fun conversation to begin, right? So often it gets pushed back and put off to a later date. I really would encourage you all to prioritize this healthcare directive and making sure that it's taken care of and done. And so if you think about this, Maybe that's your goal for you and your loved one for 2019. Let's make sure we get this healthcare directive taken care of and completed. Okay? Yes. Can I get a quick comment on that? So she said that tr her trust, she's got a trust document in place, and it says that, um, that you have the legal authority to make health care decisions for someone else. Now, a trust in Minnesota is not the document that enables you to be the legal decision maker for her health care. Okay? So you're going to want a health care directive specifically to cover this. All right, and that is important because a healthcare directive is widely recognizable by healthcare providers. You, if you bring a trust document, um, kind of the book, some people have a binder of a trust, it's a large document, and if you bring that to the doctor and say, look, I've got the document they need, the, if the doctor sees 100 pages of legalese they're going to put it away, right? They're not going to read it. They're not going to look at it because their job is not to interpret um, the legalese. What a doctor is looking for with a health care directive is who is the go-to decision maker, okay? So all of these other components that you can or include are important to give that legal agent some context about what your wishes would be but what a healthcare directive really should include every time is the nomination of that agent. Because this agent that you appoint can do whatever they feel like is in your best interest. Hold on. So even if you have said, I don't want care or treatment under these conditions, if your agent feels like that's in your best interest, your agent can override those wishes. So again, the most important thing you can do is designate someone you can trust. And I would recommend to not only think about that um, in maybe um, familial or marital um, context, but really who's 
best equipped to do this. It's a hard job. Um, you're wearing really two hats. If you're a care receiver, or a caregiver rather, and a healthcare agent, you're really handling two separate roles. One role as the caregiver, trying to make sure that the care receiver gets back to what you feel like is meaningful, quality of life, but your role as a healthcare agent is not that. It's not the rehabilitation. Your role as a healthcare agent is really to wear a hat and say, what would my loved one want? If he or she could communicate in this setting, what would they want? And am I able to carry out that, that choice? Well, yes. Right. So, so what she was saying is she and her husband completed a five wishes form. Is that good enough? Is that the, will that satisfy the health care directive that she needs to have? And I will quick go, I'll come back to those slides, but there are lots of different forms that a health care directive can take. I've included a few here just as um, an example for you. Five Wishes is one of those forms. You can get it or download it from the internet. It does cost a little bit to download, I think under $5 per form. Now, the five wishes form doesn't resonate with everyone, right? Each of these forms has different formats, and there might be some that are easier for you to complete. So it might help to look at them online, but don't let that be um, the thing that's holding you back. Oh, I don't know if this is the best form for me. Remember, our most important part of a directive is appointing that legal decision maker. So if the five wishes is one of those forms that you could have. There's also Honoring Choices Minnesota. Honoring Choices Minnesota has a free downloadable form, and they have both a short form and a long form. The short form is really just the designation of an agent. The long form really goes more into what are your values about health care and treatment related decisions? Now, um, I don't, although I'm harping on the designation of an agent, I don't want to undermine the importance of thinking through some of those things and having those discussions with your loved one. Because as a caregiver, if you're in the role of a health care agent, you really want to feel like you, you know what they wanted if they were able to speak for themselves. Okay? Now, the University of Minnesota Extension has a downloadable form for free available as well. And really, any estate planning attorney or elder law attorney will be able to do a health care directive for you as part of your estate plan. Often, medical clinics or providers have forms as well that you can get through that provider. Okay, so I'm going to go back and talk a little bit about why are healthcare directives so important, okay? Why do you need to have this form? Now, I think that it's an important thing, not only for the caregiver, but the care receiver, okay? So the care receiver, by doing this directive, they're allowed or enabled to protect their own autonomy and decision-making. They're the ones appointing the right person, the right legal agent for them. They're the ones selecting that and also indicating what they want or don't want. It allows them to maintain some independence, so even if they can't speak for themselves, they're still driving what's happening to their bodies. Okay, I think that's really important psychologically for people. Um, and it's really important for the caregivers and families to have that as well. It also appoints a legal decision maker over and over again. You've heard me say that. And it can serve as a guide for care providers. So what if you don't have one of these? What if you don't have a health care directive and the crisis hits? So you've had maybe a chronic um, condition, but then you have an acute care crisis that it results in someone being unable to make their own health care related decisions. There's really no clear path. And what I mean by that is each provider is going to handle that scenario a little differently. 
And I can tell you in the medical profession, it matters a lot whose boots on the ground in there when those events happen. Okay? So if they don't have a document in their system and your electronic medical record, they're looking to whoever's in front of them to make a choice. And that person who might be in front of them is, might not be the person that should be in that role. And you could have a medical provider say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to, the default for us is to treat. The default for us is to provide care to get this person back um, upright, okay? So they're going to try all measures to get that person back to health or what they think is health, right? They're not going to say, you know, this is likely futile treatment for something like pneumonia, all right? No, they're going to treat a condition because that's kind of the default in our Western um, society, right? So if that's not something your, your care receiver wants to be the default, it's very important for it, that to be clearly delineated. And I've also put up here that if there's no legal decision make, maker appointed, we might have to go through what's called a guardianship proceeding. And a guardianship is exactly the opposite of what, my, what I want for my clients, okay? Here's what happens in a guardianship. Somebody comes, calls my office and says, hey, we didn't have a health care directive, and now my loved one can't speak for themselves and requires chronic care. The doctor says, or um, the hospital says, we need to get a guardianship because he can't make decisions for himself anymore, so now I want, need to do that. And I said, I'll meet with those people and we'll go over everything. I draft the documents and I send those documents to the court. And if we're in Hennepin County and I file the petition for guardianship with Hennepin County, guess how long it takes for me to get before a judge in Hennepin County on a guardianship? Any guesses? You said 30? Three days at least. Three days at least or 30? 30. 30. What? Three months. Right in between you. Right now it's taking me at least eight weeks to get on someone's calendar for a petition for guardianship. Now, can I say it's an emergency and get there quicker? I have to prove that the person is either um, going to be homeless or their, ca their care is going to rapidly deteriorate if they don't have this. I need to prove that through medical support and evidence to get there within five days. Very rare can I get in front of a judge within a week's time frame. And because it's a court process, this means you're paying legal fees and court filing fees to do something that you could do right now at no charge, okay? So I want to save you in otherwise stressful times a stressful situation like this. So make it your goals for 2019, after you get through the holiday season, um, to do your health care directive. But um, people laugh when I say this, but you can imagine my, in my house, my sister's the head of skilled nursing facility. Um, so she's a registered nurse working in long-term care, and I'm an elder law attorney. So you can imagine how fun our table talk is, right? <laughs> okay. So, you know, we bring these, we have discussions with our loved ones pretty regularly about what we've seen in our jobs, in our, in our work, in our lives about these situations, and we, we talk with our parents and our extended family about these sorts of decisions. And people often say, gosh, that's such a downer. I don't want to do that at the holidays, right? But it doesn't have to be a morbid conversation, right? This is, we often think about estate planning or plan, these legal documents you need as planning for what happens 
when you die or what happens when you, you're incapacitated. And yes, those are, those are things that need to be addressed, but the point of a healthcare directive is to communicate how someone wants to live. And then, as part of all of our lives, we all are going to die, right? This is a, the only guarantee we've got. I haven't met one person who's immortal yet, okay? Still waiting. We're, it's just a natural part of our life cycle. So let's figure out how we want to do it in the best way possible. Let's plan so we have the best outcomes that we want, all right? So start maybe when you're with people you love over the holiday season, start getting into this, this frame of mind where you have these discussions because it's important to have the documents, but it's also important to have what I call the talk, okay? Have the talk with your care receiver. Have the talk with other caregivers in the community. Have the talk with your loved ones, all right? This plan can always be reviewed or revised as health conditions change, but start it now, okay? Yes. Okay, so what she was talking about is, Ken, if, you're, if your loved one has PD and the handwriting's bad, you can complete or fill out the information. They need to be able to make their mark, be that a mark or a signature. Now, if you have downloadable forms, you can't usually change the signature block, but when I'm working with clients at my office, I've had clients who can't sign anymore, but they can still direct a loved one or someone there to sign on their behalf. That's also legal. legal. It requires a different kind of um, certification or sworn statement that accompanies it. But yes, someone can complete the form as long as their loved one signs it for themselves. And it needs to either be notarized by a notary public, not necessarily a lawyer, okay, or two witnesses that are over the age of 18 and are unrelated, okay? Yes, sir. I don't hear that well. Yeah. You have covered it, and if you have, I apologize. Don't worry. Would power of attorney accomplish the same thing? Great question. So what he asked was, would a power of attorney document accomplish the same thing? And the answer is no, okay? A power of attorney in Minnesota is a legal document that covers who can make financial decisions on behalf of their loved one, okay? Who can sign financial documents like a check, a real estate deed, um, a contract, an investment account? Who can handle those decisions on behalf of their loved one? So a power of attorney is really for, for finances. A health care directive is for health. You should have both. Most of today is focused on care-oriented um, documents, so we're not going to get a ton into powers of attorney, but I'm glad you brought it up because it is something that should be in your toolkit, and that is something that, um, as a caregiver, it's important to think about how, if your loved one can't manage the financial transactions anymore, how you can do that for them. And legally, that's through a power of attorney. Okay? Now, yes, sir. Yes. So great question, and I'm going to try and summarize it just so for those of you who may not have been able to hear. But he shared a story about his mom who had a form that said, do not resuscitate. Maybe it was part of her health care directive that said, do not resuscitate, a DNR. And, uh, and he said she was resuscitated or put through on the defibs five times and then was, was revived. Okay? So what is a DNR good for? Do not resuscitate order. Now, What's important to keep in mind is a health care directive is really important for people with chronic care needs, but it's not the best form for emergency medical situations, all right? 
you might say, why not? I've said what I, the type of care I want. I've said what I don't want in that form, and I've nominated a legal decision maker. Why is that not enough? Well, apparently lawyers and medical providers don't play nicely in the sandbox together, right? No, I, that's not really a fair description, but what is true is medical providers want everything in a certain format for them to follow. So if somebody does not wish to be resuscitated and under any circumstances, okay, not just if they, they fall over and, um, or they're towards the end of their life, maybe they've been diagnosed with less than six months to live and they have an a acute crisis during that time, if they do not want to be resuscitated under any circumstances, the best thing you can do is actually get a doctor's order. Okay, a doctor's order that says, do not resuscitate. It can also say, do not intubate. And that goes into your medical record and is flagged. You're coded a certain way. You would get certain um, color bracelet when you come in. There's things on the door for every nurse and professional that walks through that door. There is an assumption or a um, presumption for medical providers that everyone wants to continue living for as long as possible thanks to the grace of modern medicine. Okay, So if that is not what you want or what your care receiver wants, you need an actual doctor's order. You can accomplish this through a document called a POLST, all right? Provider's Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Now, you might say, life-sustaining? Brenna, you keep talking about do not resuscitate. That's not life-sustaining. Well, it's a bit of a misnomer, but in essence, this document is a one-page form, and I've got a picture of it up here. It might be hard to see the details of. But it goes through a series, it's a very short form that a provider signs as well as either the patient or their healthcare agent can sign it for them, okay? And it says whether or not they want things like CPR or whether they do not want to be resuscitated. It also asks no antibiotics under any circumstances, or maybe sometimes they might want antibiotics. It goes through very specifically certain issues that would be pertinent for someone. And for someone, it, typically a pulse is used for someone who's either at the end of their life or they're medically fragile. And that could be medically fragile due to a chronic illness like PD, okay? So if you're saying, I do not want to re be resuscitated or intubated, or I know my loved one doesn't, under any circumstance, then it would be important to go through a pulse with your doctor. And he'll have the, form. the doctor has a form because it's a doctor's order. It is not a legal document or... Um, it is a doctor's order that even emergency medical professionals can follow. So say someone's living at home with PD and they do not want to be resuscitated, but they're having a hard time breathing. You call 911. The emergency medical providers, their default, okay, will be to get you alive to the closest hospital. That is what emergency medical professionals do, EMTs, firemen, they will try to get you alive to the closest healthcare provider and then see whether that doctor feels like the treatment, further treatment is merited. Now, if you have a pulse that says, do not resuscitate me, the EMTs can follow that pulse. They will not resuscitate someone in their home. If you just have a healthcare directive saying that, I do not want this, that will not be enough for the emergency medical professionals because they only have authorization to follow doctor's orders, okay? And there is a standing order to get people alive into the hospital. So if you don't want that to be your standing order or your loved ones, this is important. Now, 
I also want to talk about um, where you keep something like a post or a healthcare directive. I do all of you live in the eight county metro area? Close, right? You're here, no? Okay, well, I can't speak to your community, but I know in the eight county metro area, all the EMTs and firefighters are trained to look at the freezer, the fridge, to see whether you have a healthcare directive or a post there. They check that when they arrive. So it might not be a fun thing to see on your fridge, but make room next to the pictures of grandkids, kids, loved ones, right, for your health care directive and your post right there, okay? Now, hold on just a second. There is a great thing called a file of life. Also, there, that's a paid little um, sticker magnet for your fridge. There's also one called Vial of Life. It really is the same product, just marketed a little differently. And it's there to indicate whether you have these documents, who the, an emergency contact is. Okay, these are um, sometimes what people use to stick their, their healthcare directives and pulse, affix them to the fridge. Yes. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so great question. She asked, if you are a snowbird or if you go travel, what, would you, what do you do? The answer is a healthcare directive. Copies are just as good as originals. So if you paper the world with something, <laughs> paper it with your healthcare directive. And that works for Pulse, too. It works for Pulse, too. Mm-hmm. They should definitely go, the people it should definitely go to are your doctors because it'll get scanned into your emergency medical records, which are now becoming more and more accessible everywhere, okay? It can also go to your legal agent. They should have a copy. Um, you should also have a copy on your fridge or bring it with you when you travel. To that end, when I taught, began, I said, make sure that you start getting organized and put together a one-stop shop. And if you remember, a one-stop shop was supposed to contain your health care directive, a HIPAA release, doctor's contact information, medication list. It can also contain this pulsed form. And if you travel... It is very important that you bring a copy of all of that with you, okay? Because even though we all hope for, to have wonderful travel experiences with the best health outcomes, right? That might not be the gifts we're given or the cards we're dealt. Yes? Right. So Mel brought up a great point. The Parkinson's Foundation has a resource for this. And it, it used to be a, in like a butt pack or a little, it's not anymore? Okay, it's a zipper pouch now. Okay, great. So there's one here today. That could be a, kind of your starting spot to gather this stuff together. Great. Wearing care kit. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I want to go into a little bit about um, how things go from what we've been talking about, which are acute care crises, to planning for long-term care or chronic care. Okay, so oftentimes this time of year gets really busy in our office. And the reason is 
people spend time with their loved ones and they realize they're not doing as well as they had thought. Okay, so at the Monday after Thanksgiving and the uh, after the Christmas holiday, we get a ton of calls from caregivers um, as well as family members saying, you know, I just spent time with my loved one and things are not going well. Okay, so thank you. Um, often the point of entry into the long-term care maze is when a person's needs for their chronic condition can no longer be met at home without assistance. Okay, so typically that's a crisis entry. All right, something has happened, a fall, um, maybe a, um, a flu influenza or pneumonia has happened, and it results in them being unable to continue to receive care at home. Typically, it's precipitated by a hospital stay, and then loved ones call me from hospitalization saying, you know, I've been told that they're not going to be able to return home without care. This is the point of entry. It's also, as I said before, not a great time to make big decisions, all right? So I want you to think a little bit, and I want to speak to this a little bit because this is for the Parkinson's community, that PD changes really that point of entry. Sometimes it's, um, it might not be a fall that precipitates this entry point. It could be changes to mobility, right? Changes to cognition or the ability to swallow. It might take time to get there, but that often can, with PD, be the point of entry into long-term care. There are, there's a picture in here about an elder care continuum, and it kind of shows that we go from upright, functional, um, no, no functional mobility limitations, to maybe needing some assistance, all right? Um, maybe using a little bit more supports like canes, walkers, wheelchairs, to being a, unable to handle this without another person providing that level of care. And there's also a wide range of where you can receive care, right? Be it at home, in assisted living, um, adult day programs, any number of options. But there is cost associated with care because right now in this country, we don't have long-term care is not really something that's a universal, um, a universal guarantee or health um, outcome. So long-term care is privately covered unless you have long-term care insurance that covers care needs or unless you have um, your stay is short enough where Medicare covers that stay. So what I hear about people's concerns regarding long-term care is really availability of quality care. They really want to be sure that the care that their loved one's receiving is the best. But people's default is, of course, they want to live in the least restrictive environment. Most of my clients tell me they want to leave home feet first, right? Okay, so they do not want to enter this long-term care maze. They want to be at home with the supports they need to do so successfully. There's real concerns about the cost of care and the burdens of that cost for their loved ones. Um, and there's worries about isolation. If I move out of my community or home, to another place, how am I going to make sure I'm still involved in the community in the same way? How do I get the resources I need um, so I'm not lonely? And there's concerns about changes to the family dynamic, and so much of what we've talked about today or what you've heard are, you know, going from partners, maybe be it husband and wife, friends, um, to Caregiver, care receiver is a huge shift in the family dynamic, okay? 
It is also a shift if it's a child providing care for a parent, right? Um, this causes a lot of problems. I get, um, I take off my counselor of law hat, put on my other counselor hat often, because parents and children, when there's a shift to that role, is very traumatic on all parties, okay? So all of these concerns about long-term care are real, and they're something that has to be addressed, but it is helpful to be able to do so and figure out what your needs and priorities regarding care are prior to the care crisis, because then we can be sure that the options we're looking at are really tailored for what's best for you and your family. Now, I've listed out in a couple of slides all of the different places or types of care, long-term care that can be given. And I'm gonna run through these really quickly um, because we're running out of time, uh, but then I wanna go into some resources real quick to finish it off. So home care and home health care are two different things. Home care is often chore services, light housekeeping services, maybe um, trip errands that you might need assistance with. Home care agencies and home health care agencies are not necessarily synonymous, okay? So depending on what your loved one needs may dictate where to start. In my experience, people wait too long before looking at those resources. Or people say, I don't need somebody to babysit me while you run an errand. I hear that all often as well from care receivers. Um, respite care can be a short-term strategy to bring some care in to the home. Home care can be that. Allow the care receiver to go out run errands, meet with a support group, friends, and have someone there for their loved one. Adult day can also offer that support. Um, I'm going to go into kind of the difference between facility level of care, just so you have this information. There are independent living communities, of course. The, these are places where typically they're marketed for people 55 and up, senior housing options, senior apartments. They typically, unless they're part of a campus, do not offer care in home. They might have lots of amenities, but they might not have the care that can be brought in. Assisted living in Minnesota is really licensed on the state level as housing with services. It is not a some place that necessarily offers skilled nursing capability. That means the presence of someone with a registered nursing license round the clock. Things like occupational therapy, physical therapy. Assisted living does not necessarily provide that. Assisted living is really apartments with the ability to contract or access care somewhere close, okay? typically through a registered provider that the, that the assisted living campus has a relationship with. Now, people often say, yes, my loved one's in a high level of care. They're in assisted living or memory care. But that is not skilled nursing facilities. And the reason I bring that up is when we're looking for a place for, um, for a care recipient, we really need to make sure that we try to minimize the total number of moves. And that's just a quality of life thing for everyone. I was talking with Jennifer before that she and I both moved about two years ago. And we are lucky to be healthy and well during that move. And that move was, our moves are traumatic. It takes us a while to get re adjusted to go through a moving process. For if quality of life is one of the biggest concerns, we wanna try and minimize moves for a care recipient. 
So we want to ask the right questions about the level of care these places can offer on the front end. We want to be educated consumers, okay? It's a lot to do and navigate as a caregiver. So there are, there is help, okay? And I'm going to skip ahead because we're running out of time, but these critical questions come up often. How do we get the best quality of care and maintain the or improve quality of life, number one. Number two, how do we access payor sources or the financial resources we need to pay for this care? And how do we understand which benefit provides what service? The differences between medical assistance, Medicaid, um, Medicare. And how do we protect the maximum amount of our resources so that our care needs or these chronic conditions don't consume life savings? And, you know, um, what I would suggest doing, because the puzzle can be overwhelming, is that we start putting together life care plans. And our office started doing life care planning because of our work with the Parkinson's community. So one of my founding partners, Chris Mazur, was a caregiver for her dad with Parkinson's. And he had Parkinson's for, I believe, about 25 years. And with that experience, we really realized that planning requires a holistic approach, right? We need to have a team around you through that plan because these questions are overwhelming. And a life care plan is really a strategy where we try to get a team around you to help you navigate so you know who to call when, all right? So who's on kind of the team? Well, an elder law attorney should be part of your team. <laughs> Okay, what an elder law attorney knows is not only the legal documents you need, but how to protect assets and how to access payer sources to make sure that the quality of care you need can be paid for through any mechanisms available. We also utilize a life care coordinator, which is a social worker, a licensed social worker, to help make sure that we find the right care that that's required. A public benefits specialist helps us apply. In our office, we have one on staff that helps navigate and talk to the county or the Veterans Administration to access those um, financial resources to help fund care. And I say authorized or appointed loved ones. So the healthcare agent might be part of this team or a child who's a caregiver who's very um, in the loop. I had a, every time I have a phone call with one couple, it's a blended family. Husband and wife are on the line, and a child from each family is in that phone conference each time. And they're all getting the information at the same time to be sure, because all of us hear it in different ways, of course. Um, we also employ kind of medical professionals that need to be around us. That's why when I said as part of your getting organized, you should have the list and contact information, that's important to your life care plan. Um, financial advisors, if you have one, and accountants can also help with all of this. This is a lot, but you don't have to manage it alone, right? So um, at our office, when we're doing life care planning, kind of you say, you let us know who are the people that are a part of your team, and we're kind of the quarterbacks. We work with you, right, and say, okay, we think that at this point we're going to throw the ball here, and that's the best play for us to get 10 more yards, all right? So... Get the help you need and start early, all right? We want to put these plans together before you're in crisis mode because we can only handle so much at one time. 2019 for all of you, make it your goal to get organized. Identify your team or your key players that you utilize. Start considering your values and the legacy you want to leave and your loved ones want to leave. 
meet with an attorney who has experience in elder law who can help you navigate these issues, execute the important legal documents, have the talk and review it. People often say, oh, I did my documents. I'm going to put them on the shelf. And they bring them to me, and there's about an inch of dust on them, right? They haven't looked at them in 20 years, right? When we're navigating chronic conditions like PD, we need to review it under some of the following. Number one, I'd say at least annually. Number two, if, a, if your condition changes, right? Number three, if there's a change to the family dynamic or this team, we might need to take a look, does this still make sense? But every year, you don't need to do it with an attorney, but try to review this with your loved ones on a regular basis. So thank you guys for staying with me and letting me take up a few minutes of, of your next session. Thank you.